Hey, everybody. How are we doing tonight? This is our first live uh, on the EFP. We used to do it for Microsoft and for Refresh and Reload. We're going to be interviewing Beetle and Grimm tonight, which you can see below. New people not only sponsoring EFP, but making something that I have wanted since childhood, I think. Uh, honestly, this is one of those things that I didn't think I'd ever see because of problems with IPs and who's allowed to do what. But today, they are bringing us something that I'm super proud about. So I'm going to do a quick introduction with them, and then we'll dive right into the first segment. Hey, everybody. How are we doing tonight? Doing great. great. Good. Um, let's do a quick interview as the real simple who you are and where you're from. Honestly, I know you guys have done this a thousand times, but just in case someone doesn't know, um, we'll start with uh, Paul over here. Do you want to give an introduction? Sure. Uh, I'm Paul, uh, one of the founders of Beetle and Grimm. Uh, I live in Brooklyn. Uh, so I'm the one on the East Coast calling in. Uh, I We all do a lot of different things at Beetle and Grimm's, um, but uh, my special superpower is uh, I pay all the bills. You pay all of the bills? <laughs> <laughs> I do. Jeez. All right. So, Bill, what about you, bud? Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Bill. I, I live in Los Angeles okay. with the rest of the, uh, the founders, uh, other than Paul, who... Uh, you know, we can't get to fall in line <laughs> quite yet, but we're working on it. Um, I uh, I don't know what my exact role is in the company. Uh, well, I guess we'll talk about it a little later. We do rotate uh, jobs a lot, but I was the project lead on the Avernus Platinum Edition, and I am the project lead on our new Pathfinder Character Chronicles. So that's... Oh, really? Project. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> What about you, Charlie? Yeah, I'm Charlie. I'm uh, also in LA, unlike Paul. And uh, <laughs> I am the support goblin and supreme marketing goblin, if you've seen the emails or, uh, or reached out to complain about things. Uh, yeah, and uh, like, like Bill said, we, we rotate around. I was the project lead on Eberron as well. So before we jump into the first topic, I have to ask this. I, I was a big fan of Eberron. What made you guys pick that? Why why Eberron? Like, there's so many things you could have picked. Was it just the fact that they were coming out with a campaign setting and you saw a chance to do it? Or was yeah, there more to it? A couple things. I mean, certainly the fact that they're, they were doing a release, so it was an opportunity to hit new stuff, you know, because they were releasing a new source book for it. Mm -hmm. um, also, I happen, you know, just... From a personal point of view, I was running a game, and you know, Bill was in it, um, and I ran Paul for a while too. Um, that honestly, it was like they stole my stuff. So I, I, I just, I just love Everon. I just love how how weird it is and how they subvert a lot of the uh, things you get yeah. used to in D and D. Uh, and so it was just, it was just pure fun, and it it presented it presented itself at the right time, and we just sort of jumped on board. Yeah, I won't get into it too much, but I felt the same way. I entered the competition for it with my own setting, and it's weird to see some of it trickle into what they put out, and you're like, oh, people thinking alike, why in the fuck mm -hmm. is this happening? <laughs> so I had to, I had to at least ask, because I do, I have a soft spot in my heart for Ebron as well. Yeah. But with that, we're going to go into the first segment. Uh, when I used to do Refresh and Reload, those who used to follow, we had a Game bite section. And I'm just carrying it over to this. We've done a few other in interviews that are canned and coming out over the next like three to six months. But the concept here is really simple. I put a couple topics in a chain between them and myself. We each pick a topic. If there's a, two people, sometimes we'll do three, but we have a lot to cover tonight. And I mean a lot. So, without further ado, then, what are we picking on your guys' side for the segment tonight? Uh, so, I thought we would talk about. Um, well, I mean, I guess. Well, which one? Which one did we pick? We talked about two of them. We picked the. Uh, I think you guys said you want to do the Twitch and DR. Yeah, we do. Yeah, I think the idea of just talking a little bit about how Twitch has changed and impacted, uh, you know, tabletop gaming, and uh, you know, I mean, certainly since we when we started playing so long ago. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and what's happened now. I really think that, you know, Twitch and live streaming has just been an amazing, uh, had an amazing impact on games and just, I mean, just being able to see other people play D and D I think has yeah. just changed how people learn about it and, uh, you know, how they can kind of come in and join. I think it's been great. 
Yeah. Uh, do you all play online together at all then with this, this like live streaming? Well, Does Beetle and Grimm live stream their own stuff right now? I thought you did. Uh, we, we've we've live streamed a couple of little one shot kind of things, but we we haven't started hosting our own games yet. Um, mm. we're, we're we're certainly Time. talking about it, uh, but <laughs> yeah. it's it, it is it's definitely a challenge to 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 schedule it, and and you've got to commit to it. I think you know to make it really viable, and and we just yeah. need to make sure we have enough time and energy to commit to it and do it the way we want to do it. But um, just on a very personal level, we have always been um, in-person gamers up until COVID with the exception of Paulie, yeah. who, who has always had to, uh, <laughs> to, to phone in. But, you know, he's just been a, a laptop sitting on the table <laughs> at a live game as opposed to, you know, a live game. It's, it's better, honestly. Because <laughs> you can just close it. If you talk they to can you. mute me, yeah. yeah. Well, I would say for Paul, it's probably great because you don't live near him. Are you moving out there anytime soon or what, man? You, you living out in Boston? Come on, Paulie. Come on. Yeah, I know. Well, Any? I just want to point out. I just want to point out. Everybody used to live in New York with me. It's not oh. like I left. It's that I've been in the same spot for 25 years. Just okay. that everybody else left. So. Sure, sure. It's usually the person who stays, it's their fault. You know that, right? <laughs> <laughs> like when three people leave, yeah, the buck passes to the guy who's still there. Yeah, yeah. well. Clearly. So I, DRMs on Twitch have been huge lately. Uh, and I guess I'll give a quick overview for those who don't know. Mm -hmm. DRMs have been around for a while. The music industry has slapped people using music without the proper rights since i mean record companies have been around and we saw youtube go through it many years ago and youtube spent i think it was like three to four hundred million dollars to make software to pre-check your your stuff you upload to make sure you're not using any illegal music if you are you have to you have rights to it blah 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 right how in the world did twitch not learn from a giant then get bought by a giant and then still make the same fucking mistakes. Like, how are you letting you do this? They gave people three days warning. People had to delete, I don't know, six years worth of videos. And some of these people stream four or five days a week. And I know right. ones that even after they're deleted, and this is the big, this is the big hiccup. Um, and we're going to get into why I love the fact that there are companies making tabletop DRM music, but there are groups that deleted their stuff and, you can publicly access Twitch servers. It's a publicly hosted hard drive that you can go on and find everyone's deleted stuff. So when they deleted all their things, they are still getting hit by DRMs from six months ago when they deleted things. This is a big problem. Wow. And Twitch isn't doing anything. So a lot of people are worried about it. I'm lucky. Uh, I started this channel like right when all this started. I'm familiar with that from working in the video game industry. But I mean, you're doing... You're, you're streaming with people like D and D, uh, and I'm assuming you're going to be doing something with Paizo sooner mm -hmm. or later with the product we're going to talk about today. Sure. Music for that, I mean, even that they are using stuff from usually Sirenscape, Tabletop Audio, and these companies who are making stuff that is free to use. Mm -hmm. All of you trained in acting, right? Is that what you all went to college for originally? Was acting? Yeah, except Charlie. Those two. Yeah. Except Charlie. Those two. Charlie. Did. So you're smart, Charlie. Good man. <laughs> Uh, you yeah. skipped out on that. Oh, no yeah. Offense. He was in the writing program. Don't yeah, I got a bachelor of fine arts creative writing. I'm not sure you can be <laughs> with the smart crowd. Much as I, I went to school for art, so I hear you. <laughs> it's an it, it's a, it's a uphill battle forever. Um, yeah. You never get the fun part of the roller coaster ride. You just get the fucking climb. Yeah. So DRMs are hard. You guys are going to start streaming live here pretty soon and doing your own stuff. Do you have any idea where you're going to find your music, how you're going to do this? Because that's... No, you get hit three times and Twitch just deletes your channel. Wow. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's 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 a really good example of uh, the multitude of reasons why we are very slowly edging up to this precipice because there's a lot we don't understand about it, and um, yeah. uh, you know, it, like you say, there's a lot of risk to doing it wrong. So, yeah, because at home you just play whatever wanted. you want. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I understand why why like a company like Twitch would would back into enforcing this. It's it's technically challenging. It's a high support hurdle, uh, and it 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 drags down the experience. Honestly, so why would you do it? You know, especially if you're a, a lost leader looking to be acquired. 
why bother? They'll let let the people who buy you sort it out. Uh, but yeah, it's 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 going to be a problem. There's a lot of uh, there's a lot of talk about it in the esports and in tabletop. A lot of the people who are doing tabletop streaming, we get together, have chats, you know, off screen behind the table. Used to be at conventions, and we all saw this coming. Uh, we just didn't know how it was going to impact everyone. And for tabletop, a lot of us do things like. Play the Conan soundtrack, Gladiator, uh, the new Witcher series. If you're running Star Wars, good fucking luck running Star Wars. You know, you can't <laughs> run any of the music for Star Wars either. And then wow. I so much as tested it where there's an orchestra local and they did the entire, um, I think they did pieces from all the original trilogy. And I have their recorded music and played and that still can't be used. Yeah. Because it sounds so close to it, they, they hit you mm. with the DRM. But they can't do it to you live. It happens afterwards, and there's hmm. there's some hiccups in that. So there's some companies making music, and there are people like Norse Foundry, Harris Heller, Tabletop Audio, Siren Forge. Does Beetle and Grimm have any custom music that's DRM free that people can use right now? Like, did Avernus or any of those have soundtracks that came out with it? No, well, um, we we did. Uh, partner with Sirenscape for Avernus. Um, hmm. So people who bought that box had uh, got a got a code to um, to use the Sirenscape stuff, uh, which is amazing. I love the Sirenscape stuff. They do a fantastic job. Uh, the yep. reason we didn't do it again this year was because their schedule is behind when our box comes out and yeah. we were afraid of creating frustration of people receiving a box and then having to wait a significant amount of time before they're able to redeem that code. So we didn't do it this year, um, but that doesn't mean we won't do it again in the future. Um, yeah. No, you know, we actually, uh, you know, when we were putting videos together for the Kickstarter, we had to look into um, acquiring music for that as well so you know we've we're we're trying to figure it out just like everybody else um but there's certainly a lot of a lot of fertile ground and potential there for people to step into that space um i'm sure there are people doing it yeah it's it's a weird it's a weird section and you talked about you guys all played at home until COVID happened. Well, Paul, not you, because you won't move. <laughs> but everybody else is, you know, playing in person and you're calling in. I've done that, by the way. Not mm -hmm. fun for the person calling in. You feel so left out. <laughs> it hurts so much. Um, but the Especially when the good. food arrives. Yeah, that's the oh, worst. That's, <laughs> I don't know. You guys, are, you guys are West Coast. He's in Boston. Boston's got some good food. It's just not near where they have packs, which is really painful. <laughs> Yeah. You have to go so far to get the good food. Uh, but yeah, I I hope music hits a point. And what I would like to see Twitch do, and you guys work with some of the people in like D&D Beyond and, and whatnot, where I would love to see Twitch just charge a monthly fee, almost like if you are a restaurant, you have to pay to play audio. You pay a monthly mm -hmm. subscription fee. I would love at the affiliate and partner level if we could just pay an X amount a month and there's a list of popular music that you could play. But we're not going to get D&D &D music doing that. You're not going to, you're right. going to get Kanye West and Rihanna <laughs> and all the other stuff. That's played. I mean, don't get me wrong. I could run some like modern settings with that music, but I don't think I'm going to have System of the Down during my fantasy game. Probably not. No, I would love to no. see him do something. It needs to happen. <laughs> and so Norse Foundry and them are doing it right now, but we need more. So I'm asking you guys as the end of this, unless anybody else, anything else, please make a playlist on Spotify. Cause yeah. we can talk off screen about it, but there are some great things you can get done doing that. Uh, mm. I would love to see what you all would want to hear at your table. And that would be my final piece for this. What do you guys listen to when you play? What do we, 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 we haven't really, we've never really gone deep into music during the, during our games. Yeah, no, again, so, uh, when, when we did Strahd, Matt did, got the Sirenscape music for Strahd, um, mm -hmm. which was awesome. It was great. It was great to have, especially for that adventure in particular, having mm -hmm. some kind of ambiance was fantastic. Um, I, but I know John has broken out, you know, like you said, like, that that Conan music is done to death. You know, we've played that at the table before. 
Um, uh, you know, the, the, the Lord of the Rings soundtrack is, you know, it's yep. a, it's an easy go to for sure. You know, um, it's I think timeless. for me, like, I just don't want there to be any lyrics. Like once yep. there are words being said in the, in the soundtrack, it becomes distracting, but any kind of background music, um, you know, I, I think, um, uh, Charlie, what was that band? Uh, Pelican? Pelican is good. Uh, yeah. like wait, that's, wait. that's like, that's like hard rock metal kind of stuff, but it's, it's, it's got no vocals to it. So any of that kind of stuff can work really well. When I, when I was in high school, we used to use the original Terminator soundtrack a lot. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, <laughs> those are great. And I agree with the no, the no lyrics. The only time I ever use lyrics is if I'm cutting a trailer together for like the beginning uh, yeah. of your show. Cause I like sure. to run my stuff very mm. episodically and that works great. But yeah, the mm. DRM stuff's big. There's a lot of hits going on. I, I'm hoping when you guys start streaming stuff, you'll be forced to make your own music yep. and then we'll, we'll have more stuff to play. <laughs> um, that's what I'm hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm moving into mine really quick. This one's I, I think is going to show the gray even more than it already shows for all of us here. But uh, the next one I want to pick is, do you guys remember gold pieces as, as experience? And if so, this is controversial right now because of the new people coming into 5e. Do you miss it? I, I do and I don't. I, I, I'll, I'll say the one downside of it uh, that I noticed and this was more like back when we were teenagers than it, than it comes up now with, with John being our primary DM. But the one good thing about getting experience from just from like challenge ratings is that it's pretty codified. Like there's a very specific system of what equals what, whereas treasure is not. And you right. can kill a red dragon and get one gold piece from it, or you could kill a kobold and get 10,000 gold pieces from it, mm -hmm. um, depending on, you know, your DM's whims. So it does, it does throw in a, a degree of randomness into it, or maybe randomness is not the right word. Maybe subjectivity is the right <laughs> word for it. But um, so, you know, the sort of like uh, fairness part of my brain likes the fact that, you know, a, a system where there is a system that everybody's using, but realistically, if you, if your DM is sensible and is, is behaving sensibly, um, then uh, it's pretty nice to be able to purchase training or however it is that you justify yeah. it. Um, Charlie, do you ever use gold as experience in your games? No, no. I mean, we, we did when we were kids. I, I will say the thing that I like about it, and the thing that that one of the things with my with my homebrew games, which I try to try to bake into it, is that one of the nice things about that old system is that it gave you something to do with that ten thousand gold that you found under the red dragon. Because honestly, you, you're not going to do much with it unless you do that. So you know, I mean, how many we, holy avengers do you need? Right. I mean, well, we ran a campaign uh, that John ran that, what, and we were building a temple. So we, we actually had something we could do the gold for. The, the homebrew I run, you can take that gold and upgrade your ship. You know, but it, you have to have something to do with that gold because it just it becomes something to carry at some point. You know, it just Boy, isn't, like, isn't I mean, that what you miss most about Traveler? Yes. Like oh. when you could just go out and get put a new turret on your ship. Yeah. Upgrade, upgrade the fire control computer. You know, I mean, yep. just, I was just going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, uh, do you I, play with it at all? I mean, I, I, I vaguely remember the, the gold. I mean, are I you trying to say to... you're younger than them? That's what I just no, heard. Yeah. No, oh, I'm not. I just no, have a worse, I have a worse <laughs> memory. I just have a worse memory, <laughs> too much drinking. But uh, I, I actually, I mean, the thing that I'm, I've been surprised about is, you know, when they introduced, when D and D, for example, introduced the whole sort of milestone advancement where they sort of did away with XP and it was just, when you hit this milestone, everybody goes up a level. I remember when that came out, I thought that's ridiculous. You can't play D and D without e experience points like that's. Yeah. But I gotta say. The more we do it, I it just makes things. It just is so much 
it makes so much more sense and it keeps the party aligned so much better mm -hmm. so that you don't end up with, you know, everybody goes up a level except for me because I missed, you know, one, one night of gaming. And so I'm, you know, 10,000 XP behind everybody else. Yeah, then and there's so, that argument of like, oh, do I give the guy who missed it his bonus experience? I used yeah. to do note cards that had like multipliers. Like you showed <laughs> up times your level 25 extra experience. I know there's some people in the chat that played during that and you get RP experience. But then if you left that card out, someone would get pissed because, you know, <laughs> he got 500 and I didn't. Right. I will right. say gold is XP, though, I think is a mechanic that works really well in situations like you're saying where you're buying, you're building a fort or building a castle, that's awesome. If you're mm -hmm. thieves or Vikings, raiding, pillaging, murdering, where the goal is getting money because you had nothing to start with, I think that's a great way to do it because it, it still allows the GM to go, here's 10,000 split equally amongst all of you. Everyone goes, oh man, we each get X amount. My level goes up this much. It, it is a good meter and it does kind of show the growth of power in those games. Mm -hmm. But if you're playing something that's story-driven, like Strahd, I'm sorry, you're never leveling. You're broke. It's just not going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Just walk to the right. castle and die because it's going to be way more entertaining than you trying to get money and Ravenloft. Like it's just not going to happen. <laughs> I, I will. Um, I will say the sort of unspoken part of all of this, which is that if if gold is XP mm -hmm. and the party gets ten thousand gold, that that provides an incentive for. Uh, bad things to happen, which I've, I've been part of several times. There's only, yeah, and like, there's only so two party the members. Three levels I, higher than the rest of us. What's going on here? <laughs> yeah, or or if if there are three party members and that experience looks better for two, <laughs> right? Bad too. Or I'm a lawful good paladin and there's this really wealthy, you know, merchant. There's a, but I would love to be a higher level you know, how lawful good am I? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Although I miss it. Not, I think it's not bad. It's fun, but it's Yeah, yeah. it's weird. different. So here's yeah. my question. Does, do people still really use, like, the challenge rating system where you sit down at the end of the night and calculate all the math out? Or is everybody kind of using a more of a, a milestone system at this point? I think as soon as indie games started, everyone told experience to fuck right off. Yeah, I think you're right. I because I, 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 I don't just... want to track it as a GM, and I don't want someone else to track it. And then then you have this at the end of every encounter. What level were those goblins? What's what CR were they? Are are we are we getting extra? They seemed really tough. What's the? How about you just wait until I tell you to level? Yeah, sounds yeah. good. Like right. I, I don't I don't like that either. And I went milestone for a long time, but recently I ran a small campaign arc of like kind of like eight sessions where it was money based and i learned it from blades in the dark which is all about retiring and you retire when your vault hits a certain amount of money when you are rich enough to no longer be a thief you quit you get out <laughs> let me tell you no one gets out they always die you know in real life thieves never quit there's never no. too much <laughs> they money. just die <laughs> they don't retire there's no or retirement. or become president it's one of the two <laughs> yeah, one, one of the two one of the two that is on the nose so that's it for Game Bites. I wanted to go over that really quick. I love that section. It's kind of a great warm-up for us. Uh, but let's get into what we're actually here for tonight. Uh, you all have made some absolutely amazing pieces over the years you've been around. Six years now, right? B&G is six oh, years old? just three. It seems like... Oh, three years old. Yeah. I just was making... I wanted to see if you could remember how long you've actually had to do this for now. <laughs> but... I, I love that you guys have done what I wanted as a child with D&D, &D, which is make box sets when they were no longer around. Box sets went away, and I'm sure, I can just hear the conversation between all of you and Whiskey. I miss box sets. I miss box sets too. So do I. What do we make a box set? What the fuck would we make? What would be in it? I can hear the conversation because my companies have had that conversation as well. But you went out and did it, and you did it with the big dogs. You, you found the right people. And now you're over to my personal favorite system right now. Like, I love 5e. I think it's a great way to teach people to play. I can tell enjoyable stories. But there's something about the new Pathfinder 2 that is outstanding. But there's a lot more to track. A lot more to track on a character sheet, even though it doesn't it doesn't take a long time. And I've always wanted a way to have everything in a journal. I've owned, I don't know if you can see it, a ton. That whole shelf is full of just journals of characters and campaigns. 
but you're always got to have a character sheet with you. And then you also have to have the book with you. And you all have finally jumped the hurdle that many people have tried to jump. And they always get hit in the face and they're told, sorry, you can't print our class. Yeah. How in the hell did you do this? Like, what was the relationship? Was there a certain person that it just connected? Or did you just show up and go, hey, we're Beetle and Grim. We want to reprint your class. And they went, yeah, okay, that's cool. Bye. <laughs> but how, you know, how did that work? It's, uh, it, it's remarkably similar to the latter. And all the credit for that goes. It just to pisses me off. <laughs> um, dead serious. I mean, look, I mean, you know, if, if we had wandered in off the street, we wouldn't have gotten the same reaction. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm patting myself on the back a little bit here, which is rude, but, um, you know, we did build up a certain amount of credibility uh, for those first few years with, with the box sets and, and established that we, we can deliver on our, on our promises um, with this kind of material. Right. Um, but when we brought it to Paizo, uh, they were remarkably receptive um, and really, really generous with, um, with their collaboration and the amount of freedom that they gave us to put this thing together. Um, That's great it, to hear. Yeah, I mean, you know, if, if I can give one piece of unsolicited advice to anybody who's thinking about doing things in this space, um, the, the two most successful presentations that we've given as a company was our first presentation to Wizards when we first mm -hmm. brought in a prototype of our box. The try hard presentation. Yeah, and, yeah. And, this, and this presentation to Paizo, which was our first real interaction with them. And the one thing I will say uh, that we did right is we prepared the shit out of those presentations. We yep. had a lot of detail worked out. We spent money, we spent time. We really invested a lot of work into developing the, 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 uh, the concept so that they're not having to guess at what you're going to do. They're not going to have, they don't have to try to imagine it. We had hired graphic artists to do like a significant amount of pages of layout so we could show them exactly what we had in mind. And that helped them make that leap with us to say, now I see it. When you put your own skin in the game, like when I raised VC for video game companies, every venture capital person wanted to see how much you've done and how much of your blood, sweat and tears and sweat equity went into stuff. And, and on top of that, they wanted to see if you had the talent or had the ability to organize the talent to actually right. get the job done. Cause unless you have a huge track record and for you guys, you have a great track record, but it isn't with their system. Mm -hmm. Right. And it isn't with making this, this is kind of new. Like you, your GM screens are probably the closest thing I can think of to what you're producing here. And, right. and that kind of brings me to the question. You did Pathfinder. Yeah. Why Pathfinder? Why didn't you go to D and D for this? That's your bread and butter right now. <laughs> um, a couple of reasons. Uh, you know, it, Ever since we started, we have been uh, eager to um, to not just do D and D, but to okay. uh, to work with other gaming systems. Um, we're uh, we're excited about new challenges and working through new systems and mm -hmm. figuring out things that um, different gaming systems can offer us in terms of uh, you know new creative ideas. Um, that's the first thing. And then the second thing, uh, well, okay. So to finish that thought, we, we had it in mind that we didn't want to go out to other gaming systems and just say, Hey, look at this box we do for D and D. Can we do that for you as well? And that's sure. not to say that we won't do a box set of a Pathfinder uh, adventure because we'd love AP to. will be difficult, though. That is a different monster. It's not one book. You're talking six six books that come out over six months. Yep. Then developing for that would be difficult. You'd have to do one that's already combined together or you're going to have to find a way to do a subscription model like they do. Right, right. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole different challenge there, which is fun for us. I mean, we, we, we think that's a great reason to sort of 
mm-hmm. um, you know, reimagine how these boxes work. But um, anyway, well, sort uh, of the press monster over here, Charlie doesn't like that though, because he's gonna have to make a whole new press campaign <laughs> to do that. <laughs> no, I mean, it, it, it's it, it would be super interesting. It would be super fun, but it, boy, it would be a challenge for sure. Well, speaking of challenges, you guys did Kickstarter for this. Yeah, it's yeah. also new territory while we're, yeah. while we're talking about like you territory. just went you just went into the deep end, like off yeah. off the diving board as a kid into the twelve foot part of the pool. Uh, you yeah. made a good relationship. You did a good speech, and now how? I mean, I get that the marriage started because you guys did a really good presentation. But did you know somebody at Paizo for that before you guys decided to do the Kickstarter, or was Kickstarter the goal the whole time? Because uh, you normally don't do that. You're usually pre orders. Yeah, I mean, Kickstarter is something, you know, again, it's something that we wanted to try for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, because did everybody was, or just you? Well, uh, well, no, we all we all did. All of us at Bill. Okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> Bill, Bill has all kinds of crazy ideas that he goes off on his own on. But this we're going to get into the candles. Actually... <laughs> candles oh, are going to get talked about. Yeah. We all agreed on. But one of the things about so we've always wanted to do a Kickstarter and you know, and different, different companies and different organizations have different thresholds of, you know, uh, you know, of, of crowdfunding. And so mm-hmm. we had the idea that we wanted to do, uh, uh, a Kickstarter. And we, we thought that Paizo might be open to that. We, we did actually, we did know someone at Paizo that sort of helped us set up the meeting. Uh, but one of the things I think that was, that was so fun about that first meeting, I mean, to Bill's point, you know, it was well prepared and 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 delivered. But one of the things that was so great from the Paizo side was when they saw our presentation, they responded first as players. All of them, the first thing they said was, that is, I would love to have that. So even before oh. they put their, their business caps on and thought like, you know, is this going to make us money? Is this going to be good for the company? Everybody in that room first said, that I would love that as a player, and that was great to see. That was, and I think that obviously really helped uh, uh, push it forward. Can I ask who you spoke with? Just uh, since they're friends of mine, was it with like Mona Stevens and their marketing director? I'm assuming that's who the press was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it makes was, sense. It, I can hear him. I can hear him in my head right now. <laughs> yeah, it was um, a nice full room. It was actually pretty gratifying. Uh, yeah, that, that's awesome. They, they all they all came in and they, they they all really wanted to hear it and were really supportive and excited to um you know to hear what we had to to talk about. Yeah. So, and uh, I think one of the things about Kickstarter also, I think that that tied in. I mean, it, it wasn't just that we tried to do everything new with this. It was actually that I think Kickstarter. One of the great things about it is that it really is a a, a sort of a collaboration with customers. Yep. And if we're going to go into a new market and and a new product and a new world and a new community, we actually wanted to sort of dive in and really do something that engages. And the thing about the Kickstarter is it really is this collaboration where we're all coming together. We're getting feedback. People are coming on board and helping support us. Mm-hmm. And we really thought that that was if we're going to do this, if we're going to go in and, and really work with the Pathfinder community, we wanted to do something where, you know, everybody could, you know, could sort of come together and, and it's been great so far. Well, and that's, that, that's not on the list of things I was going to say, but as someone who's been involved with them from, you know, early beta and one all the way to now, that is something that that company does did out of the box that you only saw in the video game industry, maybe even before that, where they said, here's a play test, not to just like 15 people. They mm-hmm. said, hey, everybody, here's our play test. Hit us with it. Tell yeah. us what's wrong. Tell us what you don't like. Give us the feedback. And they've, they've adopted that concept every time. They tweak it. And uh, they really go to their community to, to get answers. And they listen, which is mind boggling because <laughs> at the size they are, that is an amazing thing. So I love yeah. that you're kind of running parallel in the thought process for how they're doing that. Was that on purpose yeah. or was that just, it happens to kind of coincide? Um, I don't think we knew that. Well, no, I, I mean, to a certain degree we did. I mean, I remember walking into there um, for anybody who hasn't been to Gen Con. I mean, I'm Pathfinder sorry. takes that place over. It's crazy. Yeah, it's awesome. And I remember. Their footprint's huge. 
Yeah, and I remember walking in there and seeing they had the um, the playtest versions of 2E, uh, the, the playtest books of 2E, and mm -hmm. seeing that um, really changed my whole uh, perception of Paizo as a company and Pathfinder as a gaming system, because that, yeah. like you say, that's a level of um, player interaction that I had never witnessed before. And commitment. They, yeah. they did collector editions. I think I have it down here. They did red collector's editions for the beta. Some people are like, it's a money <laughs> grab. I'm like, well, my my beta one that I have is worth a lot of money. It's it's worth a ton. I'll never sell it. It's one of those rare books that you know we all have. Like if you have the Ninja's Guide Untouched, that's worth money. That kind of stuff from second edition. It's worth a lot. And they did it again saying, yo, here's a collector's edition. We love you guys. Here's an extra thing. If you want to get it, if not, here's here's a softback. So that's pretty cool. And I think that brings us into the next thing I wanted to talk about. The Kickstarter itself. Let's break down what you're making for everybody. I know you're making a character journal. I know that the book is included. Like there's four classes right now. How did you pick the four classes for this? And how are the books going to differ? Um. Well, I mean, on a very basic level, you have to understand that we're all approximately a thousand years old. Um, so, you know, when we were introduced to role playing games, cleric, wizard, rogue, fighter were the that was that was the core four. That was the constant. Uh, yeah, exactly. Um, and everything else kind of expanded from there. But. In our minds, those are always sort of the, the very basics of role playing is that that four person party of those four classes. Um, so that seemed like a very natural way to start. Um, you know, look, we were very aware that Pathfinder is a different community. I know there's there's some Venn diagram overlap with the 5e community. Yeah, D20. Yeah, but but um but, but, you know, we, we know that we have to earn people's trust and demonstrate that we can deliver on what we're promising and, and that it's mm -hmm. going to take some time. So um, we thought it would be uh, overly uh, bold of us to try to, to leap out of the gate with 16 classes. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to, to introduce the ones that we thought would be most obvious and most popular and hopefully with success and with interest as people um, come to to trust what we're doing and uh, that that we'll be able to continue to um, put out new classes and keep developing this idea. I sure as hell hope we can because it this this period where you're looking at a new class and this will go into your next question um, mm -hmm. and saying, Okay, I'm now let's start talking about this class, let's say barbarian. Like, like let's, let's say, okay, we're all going to sit down and talk about what would I want in a barbarian book. Those yep. sort of brainstorming sessions are some of the most fun things that we get to do as a company. And is so, that done as a group or is there just one person that does all the design during this? Like, is your, you picked your four, you're getting ready to go in. And I know you right. say you rotate who's leading, but how, what's your project pipeline for this? Like this one person project manage, somebody else wrangles all the artists, the other person handles all the social media, and then you just shift it. Are you all talented enough to do that each time? Or are there people who are specialized at certain pieces? We're like, all, if we're you guys all, are all talented at that all the time, I need to know what the hell your day jobs are because that's ridiculous. Well, we're all equally untalented. Uh, yeah. right. So it doesn't you make any difference. Stuck across the board. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> no, we are fortunate that, um, that all of us have a good deal of um, management, project management, directorial experience in our day jobs. Sure. Um, so we all, I think, have some something of a skill set to bring to that that sort of role. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it, to tie it back to what I was talking about before, the sort of um, the sort of creative brainstorming stuff is the time when we all come together and we all chip in and yeah. we have a lot of fun with that um, process, um, where we all get to contribute and. 
we, you know, we, we've known each other a very long time. We have a lot in common, but we also all have particular points of view and we all bring in uh, different ideas to these things. And there are times mm -hmm. when Matt will <laughs> dig in his heels. and He's not here. You can talk all the shit you want. Don't yeah, worry yeah. about it. You probably won't even watch this later. <laughs> um, where he'll decide that we absolutely have to put a plushie into the Avernus box. Oh God. And we all lose our minds for about three months. And finally he talks us into it and we do it. And it's actually uh, pretty cool. So, um, so we really rely on that um, of having that sort of breadth of different ideas and points of view. Mm -hmm. um, none of our things would be as good as they are. If, if only one of us tried to, um, to take over the creative part of it. Um, is there a, is there a, a vote that happens? Like if somebody would have said we're doing warlock to at least half of the party have to say yes. Like how, what is your process for that? Yeah. There's five of us. And at the end of the day, if three well, people vote. It almost know. always comes down to Charlie actually. because he always <laughs> Oh really? Charlie yeah. just sit there well, and wait. I, I, I will say, you know, I, I think he's our Anthony Kennedy. When we when we <laughs> went into Waterdeep, which was our first box, we were really very democratic about everything, and we saw what a complete freaking morass that becomes really quickly. So we we really moved more to a you know leadership and consultant kind of model, where sure. you know Bill's driving the the books, and if he wants to do um, you know Warlock next or or whatever. He can, you know, he'll go to the group and say, hey, this is what I'm going to do. Unless somebody screams, this is where we go and, and, and go that way. As far as the collaborative meetings, I think the thing that, that has really worked best for our group is, is that sort of this phrase that it, uh, I don't remember what the origin of it, but I think it, it, it applies to us pretty well, is we all have very strong ideas that are loosely held. You know, we all come in opinionated to meetings because we thought about it. And we, we, you know, we, we know what we want. A lot of shower time thinking. Yeah, but we're, we're okay being knocked off of it if everybody else has a better idea. Yeah. We're not going to dig in our heels. Well, except for Matt. Yeah. We're not going to dig in our heels about something that's, that's, that's ridiculous. Right. Yeah, God, no, no. Right. And, and to be fair, Matt has lost just as many battles as the rest of us. I mean, we, yeah. we, we all have things that that we wanted that didn't work out. And, and to Charlie's point, that's part of what makes it work, that we've yeah. all surrendered ground uh, at different times and we all have to be ready to do that. Yeah. Well, 25 and, years, right? Gaming together, 25, 26 years, something like that. Well, for Charlie and I, it's, uh, <laughs> since we're brothers. Um, it's yeah, more right. More like 40, but uh, yeah. yeah. Does, I mean, that has to lead into it. There's always a party leader, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And I, I do think with what what ends what ends up happening is that you know to sort of also just kind of Charlie's point, uh, it, we've gotten to the point now where, you know, for one of these projects, there's a whole bunch of decisions that the project head will just make because right. they're not controversial, nobody else cares enough about them, uh, or there's not enough time, and I'm just not going to tell Bill and Charlie what I'm doing, and I'm just going to make that decision anyway. <laughs> Sometimes um, you got to. <laughs> Trustful, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, but then we come together for the, you know, we, but the great thing also is, you know, uh, when I, I ran the Icewind Dale, um, uh, uh, the, the Icewind Dale rhyme of the frost maiden box. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I was running it and I would, you know, we had, there were things that we did together and there were things I did all on my own. And then I was just at a certain point, I just got stuck on what battle maps to make. I just couldn't, yeah. I, I couldn't figure out it's a huge adventure, which ones. Uh, and so, you know, I, I came back to the group and I was like, guys, I need, I need help. Um, I can't figure out which one of these adventures, which one of these battles really, you know, are the ones that deserve uh, maps. Uh, mm -hmm. And I got some great feedback. John, you know, read the adventure and said, you know, he, if I was DMing this, this is what I would do. Uh, and we ended up picking, you know, I think are some great, uh, some great battle maps for that. And you so, upped your map amount in this one as well. Wasn't there a lot more maps in this yeah, one? All so, the towns and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So in Icewind Dale has way more, cause that was part of the feed, the feedback from customers was that they loved the battle maps and they wanted more. Yeah. So yeah, we yeah. put more in, 
Strahd, actually, I think we may have jumped the shark on that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. A little, little bit of fan that, service we'll there. We'll never get to that level again. So, yeah, yeah I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a poster tube of battle maps that they don't actually all, they barely fit in the tube. There's so many maps. My friend has it. It's, it's, I'm a cartographer, so yeah. I loved seeing that. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. so you, you guys did this. Who's leading the four books for the, or well, who's leading the Kickstarter for this? Who's leading this project? So Bill's running the, I mean, Bill and Charlie together are doing it, but Bill primarily yeah. is running the books and Charlie uh, has been running the Kickstarter. Oh, so and you're not doing working. anything for it? Why are you here? Uh, why am I? Because I was the one that, because I'm the PR guy. Because I was the PR guy. My job was to set up these interviews. So these, the four books, it's it's Cleric, Rogue, Wizard, yep. Fighter, correct? Yep. Mm -hmm. That's the yep. quintessential four. And two yep. to unlock. And, yep. and two three classes that we're about to unlock. Two classes. So one at 90, one at 140, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. So yep. one at 90,000, one at 140. And I know you're not going to say what they are, but you're really close yeah. to the 90,000. Yeah. I have an idea of what they are. I heard that you guys okay. said that these two are your favorite classes, and that's why they got picked. Oh, huh, that's interesting. Okay. Uh, I, I said that they were, yeah, I think I said in one of the interviews that they were the next, they were some of our next favorites. Favorites, yeah. yeah. Oh, besides the yeah, quick I, I, I think yeah, that's, that's true. true. I think that's fair. I mean, we ended up having to pick the ones that we liked. We picked the ones that we liked. Well, there's a lot. Paizo has a lot of them for that. Yeah. So in these books, uh, in the Kickstarter, you you do have a spread. If anyone hasn't seen it, uh, if you look at the link that we have up, you can check and see what the inside of the books look like. We have the art kind of flickering and flipping through over here. There's dice included in this Kickstarter from Gale Fork yeah. 9. There's color specific to the classes, is my understanding. I'm assuming there was a little bit of bantering about which dice, which color, because that's just the nature of the beast. Oh my so god! Inside the so much bantering. <laughs> that that, that, that <laughs> seems like such yeah. a simple thing. But a rogue you know, should have black and, and red dice. Yeah, we're doing we're doing a a book cover. So you know the mm -hmm. PU leather book cover. Mm -hmm. There's a dice tin that has art on it, and then there's the dice within the tin. And somehow we have to come up with a color scheme where the book and the tin and the dice all have a sort of thematic connection to one another. That ended up being the biggest spreadsheet <laughs> nightmare I think we have ever had with this company. Somebody works with really dice well. companies a lot. It is a nightmare. And that is yeah. what happens every time. It's always rough. Yeah. Especially if someone's colorblind. Oh dear. <laughs> oh, don't even, yeah. yeah uh. Don't even start with that. That's I so, so you have, uh, let's see here. So we got, I'll put up the dice on the screen here. So we got the purple dice on the screen right now. Is that for the cleric or the wizard? Wizard? Wizard. Purple. Wizard is purple, yeah. The, and the, the wizard has extra. And red, so yeah. There, yeah, you, can, you can get a little. Uh... Yeah. The, the wizard has extra D4 for mm -hmm. magic missile. Oh, yeah, nice. Or, so each of the, yeah, each of the dice sets are a little bit different in the, uh, the actual uh, spread of dice that are in them. So mm -hmm. we're, we're trying to customize them a little bit towards the, the class itself as well as just the colors and the tin. Nice. But the tins you guys are did really beautiful. art, too, for the yeah. tins, right? Those are yeah. all custom art. Really, yeah. really uh, happy with they look the like the They look like old stained glass windows a little bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We were they remind me of. tarot cards. That was yes, yeah, that, yeah. That, that was the vibe we were going for, and we actually yeah. – Got um got them to make a custom size of tins that are that have that uh, ratio. You would have to too, too, also to get all the dice in the damn thing. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's packaging yeah, so, nightmare. So the artist, yeah, that this artist is just done a beautiful job. I mean, uh, great. you know, really sort of creating these unique archetypes for each of these classes. That's you know specific, but sort of broad enough. Uh, and the colors, uh, mm -hmm. you know, again, to Bill's point, getting all the colors to work with everything uh, was a bit of a nightmare. But never, uh, never has an artist gotten so many notes. <laughs> oh, my. yeah, we 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 piled on that. It, that Reminds really, me of the video we, game industry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. you know, I mentioned in the uh, I mentioned in the chat and I'll, I'll mention it now. Um, the uh, So, you know, right now we have we only have the dice tins for the first four classes. Sure. Available on the, the Kickstarter. Um, but tomorrow, I believe, uh, we are going to make 
all the other classes available. So we will make even if you don't hit the stretch goals. Even if we for for all the classes, not even have, not just these six, all oh yeah, like every We're, single Pathfinder class. Well, we don't have the advanced players guide classes yet. Okay, we haven't done okay. Witch and Oracle and those yet, but um, we do have. Because I say you use purple, you're screwed for the witch. <laughs> I know. Well, <laughs> we'll figure it out. Maybe they'll be purple and black instead of purple and white. You know, we'll, we we'll, yeah. we have options. Let's not argue um, about it here. Yeah, exactly. yeah, right. No, no, no. Let's spend the rest of the time talking about which, because believe me, we can do it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, uh, so we're going to unlock all of those class sets. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we're we're making these work for both Pathfinder and Five E. So there's an uh, there, there will be an Alchemist set. There will also be a Warlock set. So it cool. covers everybody. And all of those will become available, I think, tomorrow. So uh, if yeah. you're interested in cool sets of dice, please come check out the Kickstarter for that. And, and like I told Paul when we talked originally, when you guys get your full PDF, let me know. I'd love to do a look through and a review for it. More because I'm selfish, uh, but also because I just want to see if it's what my childlike brain is thinking it is. <laughs> right. And you even did like, I'm excited because you did custom art for these for a yep. lot of the covers, all actually all the covers, right? Are all yeah, custom art pieces. Yeah, all the covers are original art, yeah. So even though you had access to the full library of Paisa, which by the way is like brain numbingly large. Oh my God, it is. It, it's, <laughs> we, you, I, you get hired, to do your own. Uh, yeah, we hired a guy named Chris Daly, who's a, a wonderful artist, but he's, yep. um, we yep. brought him on as our art director for this project just so that we had somebody dedicated to going through all of the materials to find the best stuff we could. Nice. Uh, and he's, he's doing a great job for us. Nice. Yeah. And the covers, which have been going on the screen the whole time are fantastic. Um, and then you are also, which I just put on the screen doing collector's edition versions. That's correct. And price points, by the way, if no one knows the price points for this, correct me if I'm wrong. It's $35 for the basic journal. Yep. Yep. Right. What's the collector's edition cost then? 70. 70 that's it yep and it gets a slip cover as well it has big yeah it's a beautiful slip case that's uh, uh gonna, so your pages really don't different. get all marred up when you cram it in your backpack and hit the other books that are in there because we all have done it we've all torn a book we've all been pissed right. about it at some point in time yeah you know uh, part of the fun <laughs> of this is um you know I, I know i've told this story before but you know what part of the genesis of this idea was when people started asking us about the characters of Beetle and Grimm, who were old, mm -hmm. you know, third edition D and D characters from way back when. And we couldn't remember a lot of the details uh, of what happened with that, that adventuring group. Isn't that so, what makes know, stories part, great though? The haziness. That? <laughs> That's what makes stories great though. The haziness. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Blanks, make it up as you go. Yeah. Right. It was six, six, six dragons. It was two. It was a Hydra. It's always the best story <laughs> because you don't remember. Right. But you know, part of the fun of this is is putting this this book on your uh on your bookshelf when you're done and, and having that beautiful thing sitting there. Yeah. And you know, the, these limited editions with the, the slip covers are just gonna be that much prettier sitting on your bookshelf. Uh, when you're yeah. remembering what that character's life was way back when. And I'm assuming this these books too. So let, let's, I got the wizard up right now and I have some questions real rapid fire. I don't even know if you're going to go detailed. Is right. it the full rules for each class? Yep. Yep. And I'm talking beginning of full chapter, rules. end of chapter, all of the feats that Pathfinder 2 provides. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're integrating the core rule book and the advanced player's guide. So we're awesome. taking all of the class sections, say for wizard and integrating mm -hmm. that whole class section into one big new wizard section. So I assume the fighter section is nothing but feats. That's right. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> exactly. I'm assuming you have, is this made to grow? Do you have blank spots for new things that come out through Paizo or if you're an organized play player, do you have areas for new feats to be added? Yes, we're we're the 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 first section is your character sheet, which mm -hmm. is over twenty pages long, and we're creating a huge amount of space in that. Nice. Um, so uh, we're we're leaving lots of extra room for extra spells, extra feats, extra everything, um, just okay. so that you you never feel cramped by it. We are adding pages for organized play, so you can track your. Uh, That's your good. Um, 
And it's got this full extensive journal section in the back that gives you lots and lots of room to write in if you need to add other things as well. So things like your spellcasters, your wizards, your clerics, and then, I mean, if sorcerer ends up being one of them, or if one of the larger spell classes do where you're picking like bard, where you have the four different types of magic, your occult, your primordial, and so on. Yeah. Are you going to include all the spells in that? Because that means this book's going to be like, I don't know, like 200 pages. Th that's me just doing like rough layout in my head. You're yeah. talking like 175 to 200 pages for a spellcaster. Yeah, the, uh, the the wizard book is uh, is two hundred pages. Um, it's big. Yeah, it's really big. big. Yeah. In the paper, it, are you able to erase on it? Does it take ink well? Like, does it take all that stuff well that you? Yeah, can, we've been. You don't have to do masking tape. Yeah, we we've, <laughs> we've been working on that a lot. So the 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 book will have two different paper types in it. Um, okay. The rules section will be a a, a, a gloss paper like the rule section in the core. I mean, like, like, like what Paizo room. has. Right. Um, but the journal section and the character sheet section are on a very heavy mat stock that nice. we pick specifically so that it can survive a lot of erases and abuses. That's, that's awesome to hear that. I didn't know you guys were actually doing two paper types. I must've missed that. That's awesome. Yeah. And then on top of that, you have the slip cover, you have this, but there's an upgrade option for PDFs. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't expect to see that as you guys being a physical product company. And <laughs> I mean, you can't say it, but I will. D&D &D hates PDFs. They don't want you to have them. They want you to use everything else. Paizo is quite the opposite. They're all about the PDFs. Here you go. We understand organized play is online. We understand you do this. You guys decided to do both. Was it because you're working with Paizo that you said, hey, we're doing both? Otherwise, we may upset fans. What was the reason? Well, I mean... You know, not not a small part of it was the fact that you know Paizo agreed to let us let us use their infrastructure to protect the D, the the PDF, so we didn't have to just you know hand them out. I mean, there, there, yeah. there's some reality there, right? Yep. Um, but no, look, I mean, you know, I think I think we took a hard look at ourselves at some point. It's like, how are, are we playing right now? You know, we're mm -hmm. we're playing online. Um, that was and, one of my questions tonight, actually. COVID, like, is that why you did it? It, it, it certainly played a part. Yeah, I think it certainly brought it to our attention and, and made us understand it a little better. But um, mm. yeah, I mean, I, I, I think we didn't realize what a huge part PDFs play in the Pathfinder fans world. The ecosystem is big. I mean, yeah, they travel I, for organized play. Could you imagine bringing a stack of I don't know if you guys ever played like Starfleet Battles, but I don't want to bring a stack of books as tall as me yeah. to the table every time I go to play organized play. So Starfleet having PDF is a big thing. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm talking about. Yeah, I yeah, hit yeah. something for Charlie there. He played some Starfleet Battles is what it sounds <laughs> like. Oh, we missed this. I was, oh, that's awesome. I was the Gorn exclusively, and I was so angry when in uh, future editions, when they started giving all the other races plasma torpedoes I as well. Just... Fuck, uh, fuck that. That was bullshit. Yeah. Bullshit. Thank <laughs> that you. was bullshit. Yeah, they made, they made all the races have everything. Yeah. No. With different no. names. Suck. Listen, I want my diversity in my spaceships. That's yeah. right. <laughs> Damn it. It's uh, the only yeah, time you no, can stay no, that I, right now and get away with it. <laughs> I, I think when we, uh, you know, when we started digging into it and we saw how much of a, a, a an established piece that was in, in the Paizo fan base, uh, we mm -hmm. just decided... We had to figure out a way to do it. So, so was this new for you? Because a lot, a lot of people think that, and I know this isn't true. As someone does design, what you send to print and what is a PDF is actually a very different file. Yep. The amount of work that goes into making a form fillable PDF that doesn't look like trash is an, an art form. Because I mean, we all love Adobe, but they only let you make certain kind of boxes. Like it doesn't actually go the way you want a lot of times, especially in InDesign. Same thing. So yeah. was this, this is a new hurdle for you all. Was this difficult or did you say, we're not doing it? Fuck it. We're hiring somebody for it. <laughs> well, well, we'll let you know. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because that's, that's hard, man. And, yeah. and at least you're not, are you hyperlinking this whole book too? Because Paizo stuff is all hyperlinked. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see what we or can I should do. Say, we're, we're, it should we're, all be hyperlinked, but it's not. It should be. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, listen, you know, we're we're going to we're we're not 
we're not claiming to be, uh, you know, to, to be experts in that field. We're going to, we already make... talked about that earlier. None of you are. Yeah. yeah. We don't, none of us are experts in anything. Right. 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 Um, let's make sure but... good project managers. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, but yeah, we, we've, we've contacted some people who have experience in it and I, I, you know, we'll definitely be bring, bringing in, um, some okay. experienced voices to it. We're not going to try to just make it up on our own. And, that's, um, that makes me happy to hear. <laughs> yeah, I think I think it'll I think it'll come out well. So you all are doing this. The Kickstarter is going. Before we talk about the one thing that you handed me tonight that we're going to talk about in a sec here, we'll add it in. Um, yeah. Actually, well, let's do it before we talk about how you'd sell because I think this might be a good selling point. Let me switch this over. Tonight you sent me some new files, uh, some new images that I knew was coming, but I don't think anyone has seen them yet. That's correct. So they're on screen now. What 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 exactly are we looking at here? So Is the um, whiteboard something? Yeah. So so this was the first of our stretch goals that we unlocked, and mm -hmm. it's something that we were uh, we always envisioned being part of this product. So we're really really glad that we get to uh, include it. Um, so what it is is it's uh, it's it's a dry erase board that is mm -hmm. pre-printed for the, the things that are most likely to change over the course of a single evening of play. So the idea is that you can sit it there on the table next to your book and the things that are going to change over and over again during the course of that evening, things like your prepared spells, things like your hit points, your hero points, um, to, in order to save wear and tear on the book and to just give you some ease of use there at the table, yeah. um, we're, we're providing these pre-printed dry erase boards um, uh, to, to use at the table. And then you can, you know, record things in your book at, at the end of the night. Are these that, in the book or they just come like with it? Yeah, no, they're in the book. Um, okay. There's a, I can actually show you a prototype. Uh, Ooh. Ooh. Showing the rack prototype. Uh, yeah, the guy in Boston doesn't get to see this oh, at yeah, all. Oh yeah, here I have it. Here I have it. I have, a, I have like <laughs> I, literally, I have like eighteen different prototypes on my desk. So I have to figure I, out I, which one. I, you you can't see this desk over here. It's a nightmare right now. With yeah. all that kind so, of stuff. Uh, so, so this is the way it's going to work. Um, okay. And it's black on black, so it's a little hard to tell. But see, there's <laughs> there's going to be a oh a, a protector pouch in the back. So it slides and, out. Yeah, and, and it, nice. it sounds easy, but actually making room for the board in the binding was actually yeah. a, a real trick. Um, but so it'll it'll slide into your book at the end of the night. You, you can just close it up and uh, it, it stays with your book. But um, is there uh, extra room for sheets in there as well? Yeah, yeah, there's enough it's room in there to, to put, put loose stuff. And, and that was also the reason why we, we put this elastic yep. band on here so that even if you just want to throw stuff in your book, you got a map and you just want to throw it in there. And Moleskine's and been doing it right for ages. Why break it? You know, yeah, <laughs> so exactly. The wheel works. And that's awesome for, you know, all those GMs who are assholes and keep handing out experience on note cards. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and the, I mean, the other thing about awesome. these, these, the other thing about these whiteboards, you know, the fact that we're, we're building each of them specifically for each class, mm -hmm. uh, I think is one of the things that, like as a spellcaster, having those, you know, level specific slots that you can sort of fill in and then cross out. Because especially in Pathfinder, it's so important what spells are in what slots. You know, it's yep. not it's not enough just to have a list of the available spells. You really need to know what you've prepared. And there's nothing worse than being a fighter and having that whole page of, you know, space for spells when you're not going to cast any spells. Weapons, condition yeah. modifiers, especially condition modifiers in this game because the one yeah. through four level, that's really big. Um, I also think, it, you know, magical item bonuses or spell bonuses that you only see for short time frames. Like yeah. that cleric who class bless every time instead of casting call lightning like you should. <laughs> like that guy. Um, like the things that are important. Uh, holy weapon, stop blessing me, cast holy weapon. But that, that stuff is important because it is what's going to... I mean, honestly, eat through your book. It's going to chew it up. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's smart. And I think before we go into that, I want to pitch. I want to hear your elevator pitch on this. I don't want the Paizo one. I don't need the whole nine yards, but I want to know how, why I should back Kickstarter for this. I think the price point alone for me, like, look, I have journals that cost more than that. Like the, 
where is my Rook and Raven? My Rook and Raven costs a ton because you can keep adding stuff to it. And I got it for a campaign I'm running, so I have it. But as a player, I love the concept of having this solid record thing that, you know, it, it feels like a wizard spell book. Maybe that's because I, I like playing wizards, but it feels like my <laughs> spell book, which is cool. But you guys built all this together. And this is going to be a question maybe you can't answer. With everything going digital, with us being in lockdown, this is going to deliver sometime in the next 12 months, I assume. That's my, I'm guessing, between now and next Christmas, we'll say. I don't want to yes. put you on a timeline. I know how this <laughs> shit goes. I've ran a lot of Kickstarters. Um, no, okay. Next 12 no, months, okay. you know. But are you going to continue updating the PDFs and print new versions of these? Is that the long-term goal as new books, if the relationship between you and Pies of the Sales go well? Perfect world. Would you yeah. update these with new info? And if not the book, would the PDF just update so that people can continue using this with new content? Um, I, I don't have a great answer for that right now. Um, it, we're, 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 we need to see how things progress. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have these up to date, up to the minute with everything that exists at the time that we publish. Besides and, their IP, I assume, because that's probably the thing you're not allowed to use. Is there actual intellectual property for Galarian? Are you allowed to use that stuff? They call their spells, their feats, they're specific to regions of their world. Oh, uh, well, I mean, in in terms of Paizo specifically, I, I, you know, they've given us access to everything. Um, oh, wow. We're not using region specific stuff because we don't want um, bloat. We don't want stuff in there that you might not use. Cool. Um, but new core rule books, you're basically supporting core. That's right. Yeah, that's right. and that's been and that's been the focus is that we want these books to support all of the core rules. Okay. Um, we recognize that there's an an almost infinite amount of, you know, additional and regional specific stuff. And to Bill's point, that's where all of the you know extra pages for homebrew and you know other kinds of things go. But yeah, I mean, our our goal is to really you know support those core rule books. And when mm -hmm. if and when Paizo introduces additional or expands on the core rules that's probably when we would you know Excellent. take another look that's that's good to hear like maybe the new wave of books covering the class, yeah, yeah. you know, i'll get updated again in the next kickstarter or pre-order or whatever yeah. um and so, people are going to need to buy a lot of these books i mean people are just i mean you're going to need a lot of these books so i you know. i know my group and when we get back to playing in person or even playing digitally i think the entire cast for our live stream, every one of them, the first question was, is my class available? I'm like, I don't know, dicks, go look at the Kickstarter. Like, is it there? Um, we have a we have a wizard in our group. We have a fighter in our group. Um, I think the other ones is investigator. So she was like really into having a journal. Um, like, that, yeah, yeah, that was perfect. Oh, there's just that. She is a Sherlock Holmes at heart. Like as a person, uh, and she's yeah. the best note taker I've ever had in the game. Like she goes, "Here's my notes." It's like forty pages, <laughs> and you're like, "Okay." So this is awesome that you've done this. Give me before we break into the next part. Give me the breakdown. Why? Why should someone back this? What is your two minute sales pitch? And who's doing it out of the group? Who's doing the sales pitch? Uh, yeah, yeah. Who's doing the sales pitch? Why should yeah. I buy this? I have the Matthew Lillard video. We can play that later. That's hilarious. But why should they buy this? You don't do, this is me being honest. You've never yeah. done Paizo. You all play D&D &D yeah. as far as we know. Uh, this is your first foray in with the company. You've never made a journal like this before. Why? Boy, uh, <laughs> you like taking risks. No, um, look. <laughs> Sold. No. Um, yeah. I, you know, I, I, I would... I feel like uh, amongst the five of us, we have an enormous amount of experience and an enormous amount of passion for uh, what it is to have a great gaming experience. And we're just, our guiding light with everything that we do as a company is to create things that really excite the hell out of us as players first. And, uh, you know, as, as Paul mentioned, Paizo was very much the same way in that meeting. And that was a big part of why we got so excited about it because they used that same guiding principle that we did. It wasn't questions about, uh, the finances of it or the practicality of it. It was, 
holy shit, what a cool idea. Let's make that happen because it's a cool idea. Yep. Um, yeah. So look, we, we understand that, um, that we're new to this space and we're going, we are bound and determined to prove to people who take this leap of faith with us that we're going to deliver for you just like we delivered for, um, for D and D fans a couple of years ago when no one had any idea who the heck we were and people amazingly were still willing to buy a $500 <laughs> box to find out who these crazy people were and what their crazy idea was. Um, and you're not even asking really, for 500 this time. That's no. right. Uh, Although if you want to, you can spend that. Yes, you absolutely can. And we welcome you to, <laughs> um, but uh, you know, I mean, like you said, I mean, I can get into the details of what, why this product makes sense, but ultimately the reason why you back any Kickstarter are for the reasons that don't make sense. It's, it's because somebody is speaking to your passion and mm -hmm. you get excited about trying to bring something new into the world that doesn't exist right now. Yeah. So I, I really hope that, that some people can see it that way and jump in and we're really gratified for the people who already have. Huzzah. Uh, yeah. And I agree. Yeah. Huzzah a hundred percent. And I, for me, I've always wanted this and D and D wasn't going to do it. I, I approached them about doing something very similar back during 3.5. Uh, oh, wow. I had some friends working at the company and it was, I wanted to put a class in the journal and if I won't do it, take the idea from me and just, just fucking make it. Stop making me character sheet packs and make me something premium because we started walking into that Etsy era and people wanting handcrafted stuff again instead of just Ikea stuff all the time. We started hitting this different era and you all realized it and you know made amazing box sets and brought the box set back. Now, I think the biggest box set change was the fact that it took up shelf space. I know myself and Jake Bacon in a chat worked for bookstores back in the day. Oh, yeah. sets were damaged and shipped back all the time. Well, now that's not a problem. So it allows us to have those things we want. Like, look at the straw box set that came out this shape like a coffin. Like, that's, there are moments now that we can get that we could not get before. And the yeah. guys are making this, which is awesome, and putting out this. And I love that you're in line with Pathfinder and doing digital and physical. I think my big hurdle would have been if you didn't offer PDF. I probably would have not been as interested in talking to you about this. Mm -hmm. But with the streaming world, with what's going on and the direction everything is, that's awesome. I, I love that you're doing that. And I was going to do a break in here, but with the time, I think I just want to push through a couple questions and we'll do our multi-shot. I'll just cut this up later and I will play our video at the end so people can see it. If you haven't seen the video that they filmed, the second one I think it is that came out, right? Yeah, it is yeah. hilarious. Hilarious. <laughs> and that brings me to this. Who in the fuck thought of the punk rock video? That Lily did. That was Matt. And again, was it was one of those Matt. things where Matt, Matt came to us and said, I mean, Matt's first idea was I want to do an unboxing video with a monkey. Wasn't that it? You yeah. wanted like That's I want to do an unboxing video with an animal. Like, let's rent a monkey and do an unboxing video. And we're like, no, there's a thousand reasons no. And then Matt's like, okay, then let's 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 hire a punk rock musician from Seattle and fly him down to LA and do a video. We said, yeah, no. I, and I, then he I did it anyway. Did, <laughs> he just did it. He showed up as just a long haired guy tattoos and a guitar. I actually think that Matt has figured out that the strategy is to offer us one completely ex insane option <laughs> so that his slightly insane option will seem reasonable. I don't know if any of you have been sales, but you offer three. They always pick the middle. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. Well, Matt, Matt just offers the, 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 the unboxing with monkeys. And then it was like, and then dogs or <laughs> puppies or something. And then, we, and, and then finally he's like, okay, well, how about if we just get a punk rock musician? Listen, and I think he was so exhausted sucks. when he the was shooting that video. Still happens eventually. Uh, the unboxing it's going to, <laughs> yeah, it's going to, Oh, with puppies. Oh, you are cats. As long as you don't get mauled to death, you would kill animal shelter unboxing with cats. You should yeah. probably do the next exploding cats one for, oh. and then do an expansion <laughs> for them and then record it there. I think that would be killer. Um, <laughs> and then that takes us to the next crazy idea. You were going to put sulfur smelling candles in Avernus. 
<laughs> or Avernus? Oh, we so wanted to. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, we really did. Did you prototype it? Did you get a prototype? No, uh, we we actually we brought it to we brought it to Watsi, and we we were reminded gently that Watsi is now part of Hasbro, and that and that Hasbro would likely take a dim view to including combustibles in a, in what is ultimately a something that Hasbro would be liable for. <laughs> so what is so maybe a big a big container that is essentially just tinder <laughs> well hold on hold on candles uh, they don't come with a match built in right ours would have though ours would have. oh well never mind <laughs> that's the problem right there you screwed it up you screwed it up already <laughs> self-lighting candles it's be yeah, man, uh, yeah, i would invite propane and then we <laughs> It was right after COVID. I would have sat the group down, had a candle in the middle. I would have handed a lighter to somebody. I'd be like, I'll be right back. I'm going to get the burgers off the grill. I just left the fucking room. <laughs> and I don't let it go and be like, welcome back to gaming, everybody. Who wants to play digitally? Like, I just, that was a genius idea. Uh, I would say there are Hell Knights in Pathfinder. So maybe just ask. They have a whole country based on demon and devilology stuff. Pies uh, will do it. Just ask them; they'll do it. Yeah, you go. Buy yeah. your own candles, and it can it can just be it can just be one of the Hell Knights praying, like the uh, the Catholic candles. He's just praying on the front of it. You burn oh, it down. Yeah, yeah. It's awful. That'd be hilarious. And then we had your April Fool's video. Two oh. goblins. <laughs> yeah, the goblins. The goblins are great. Those Dustin and Devin are. Uh, they have been. They have been hysterical. Um, are they? They work for your company. Were they just friends? How did that? They are they are friends. We met them at uh, we met them at D and D Live. Um, they love cosplay. They both work in the entertainment industry in Atlanta. They make they do costumes and and makeup uh, and special effects. And ah. it was, and bit it was Bill's idea. Bill foolishly just is like, "Hey, would you guys?" Because we because we had already created the whole mythology of the Beetle and Grimm's goblins. Mm -hmm. uh, and Charlie had been writing and sending emails uh, of the goblins and, and Bill just asked uh, Dustin, you know, would you guys be goblins for us? And they just, they took it to the, another level. Yeah. yeah. Like, uh, oh, yes. and yeah. We'll we, we gravitate towards people who, uh, <laughs> who have that attitude, just, you know, the, the kind of people who, say yes and then figure it out later that <laughs> the, the fuck it let's do it category and then you're three beers deep going wait a minute what do we, are we <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, um, the 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 gen con bar conversations yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> i know what you're talking about i've had many of those <laughs> yeah <laughs> that, that, uh, is, they're, they're, that is hilarious. they are all just such great sports and and everybody on their team has, has leapt into it and and um it came out better than we ever expected so we we had I talked to a bunch of people when I talked to you to them about interviewing you, you guys sponsoring the stream and what's going to be going on. And I had to ask what people wanted to hear. And I got a bunch of questions that I'd heard in all these damn interviews that I didn't want to ask again. Okay. Uh, because I don't I just they can go listen to other ones. And that's not that's not the style of what I wanted. But there are there's one, and I think I didn't see it answered anywhere. It's actually a pretty serious question. Um so, yeah, so and you, you know me that well already? <laughs> <laughs> so, you no, know, it is it is a good one, though. So you guys have worked now with two of the biggest dogs in the industry, Wizards yeah. of the Coast, Paizo. They're the, the, the big ones in the room, and they fight over ground since 3.0 into 3.5 to 3.75. The fight has been real. <laughs> and it's the divided audience. And I'm sure you've gotten fan feedback and some horrible stuff. Hopefully, hopefully people aren't death threatening you over dumb things. But I got to ask, if you could align with any other company right now and do anything else, what would it be? Is there a dream project? Like you got Wizards, so that dream's done. What would you do? Is there another one that you guys would love to do a product for? I'm not holding you to it. I'm just more want to peek inside the brain here. I, I bet we all have different answers, but... Well then, go, Charlie. You want to go first, Charlie? What do you want to do? Um, traveler, come, come, come back to that. That that would be super fun. Um, 
I mean, I, I could tell you I mean, that's of the of the established companies and things that would be that my, my first I mean, circle back and I'll tell you what I really want to do. All right, Paul, <laughs> I'll circle back to you. You, I'll hold, I'm holding you to it. Paul, what about you? Yep. Uh, I mean, as far as the other, other sorts of things, um, it could be anything. It could be a movie IP. I don't care. Oh, I don't know. I mean, uh, uh, I mean, I guess, yeah, I, I think, I mean, I don't know. I think, um, for me, what I would love, the thing for me would be to go back and, and just dig into the old D and D back catalog. I would love to go back and do some of those, uh, you know, some of the adventures that we played a long time ago, we talk about, you know, we all played age of worms, um, and what a great campaign that would be. So for me, it, it would be about going and Greyhawk. I mean, just, I love, you know, I have such great memories of, you know, traveling around Greyhawk and that huge map. So there's, for me, a, a fun thing to do would be to sort of dig into that nostalgia. I played, uh, so Eric Mona and I from Paizo learned that we both worked for the RPGA at the same time and did not recognize each other until much later. <laughs> like we both were working with Greyhawk back in the day. <laughs> That's so hilarious to see. I'm like, wait, no, you were the photographer? He's like, yeah, I'm like I was one of the people running everything hilarious <laughs> bill what about you man what would you want to do um I, I, yeah a couple of answers i mean I, I, and i'm not just saying this to be a company man but um <laughs> we, we are we are every bit as excited about doing starfinder as we were doing pathfinder um and you guys play uh, uh a, a little bit uh, not as much as we'd like to um and that's that's one of the reasons we started with pathfinder because uh, we, we have a much better understanding of that system and we're going to have to go back and, and really become experts in Starfinder before we figure out what we're going to do with it. But, but mm -hmm. that's really exciting to me, um, partly because it's fun and partly because it'll force us, again, to really re-examine every bit of our aesthetic. You know, you can't just do brown parchment with, uh, with Starfinder <laughs> stuff. You know, you've got to... You've got to come up with a whole different look and a whole different yeah. vibe to every little piece of, of what you're doing. And uh, that, that sounds like a really fun challenge. Um, the other thing I would mention would be we really want to, uh, to um, publish uh, some original content that uh, our, our friend Charlie here has written that yeah. we're, we're very much looking forward to. Um, yep. To put it's out weird there. weird stuff weird yeah <laughs> i know a lot funny. of people in the chat here feel like that about the game i've been running for 15 years like when are you publishing this <laughs> shit man what are you doing you want awards with it and you haven't published it's like yeah i know i just you have to teach a gm to run it that's the difficult part that is the hurdle mm -hmm. for a new yep. campaign setting is is that gm who ran it forever is teaching other people to run it in a similar light or at least mm -hmm. understand it in a way to do it all right, right charlie we're coming back to you uh, Bill stole my thunder. Yeah. I mean, that's oh, what you want to do. Oh, yeah. I, I want planescapes. I know it's D&D. &D, ah, yeah. I would love to see you all do a planescapes. We're already oh. getting Tolis again through Monty Cook Games. They're bringing Tolis back. Super uh -huh. pumped for that. But planescapes has like a sweet spot in my heart because for some reason, that and Spelljammer were really parallel uh -huh. because they ran back and forth. Um, but if I had to pick... Honestly, one thing I would love to see, I don't know who would do this. I would love to see a Tremors game. Oh. <laughs> a like good convention style Tremors game where there's great maps that come with it, train that can be taken down and destroyed. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. a board game. I don't know what the vision is just because I think it would be one of those beer and pretzel games that we don't get enough of. For sure. A Planescape that, is like, my number one. That's one of those where you say it out loud and you go, wait, really? Nobody's done that yet? <laughs> no one's done it. Hey, everyone said that about Aliens. The new Aliens game is outstanding. Yeah. So I love that. Yeah, see, Graboids. We already have some people in the chat talking about it. <laughs> I, I love Planescape. I'd love to see that done. I'd love to see you guys do it because there's some maps in there that I would like to see some new love given to them. Mm. And then I would like to see, I love the multiple books split up that we used to get in the old days where there was a player's version and a GM's version. Yeah, keep yeah. those things separate. Mm -hmm. We lost those for years when nobody wanted box sets anymore. And now we're getting them all back, which means that book, that, that box that needs to happen. So that's, yeah. that's what I would like. 
Hmm. And then the only other question I have before we go into the multi shot here is you, you guys answered a little bit, bit of this though. What was the most difficult thing putting this book together? Like it sounds so far like you guys gave a good presentation and then the doors open and the, you now apparently are on easy street. What, is there been anything <laughs> difficult during this process so far? Because I know Kickstarters are where heart attacks come from yeah. and where aneurysms come from for a lot of people. Yeah. Has anything been difficult in this process so far? Everything. Well, I will that doesn't sound everything. like it. Everything has been challenging, but I, I will say we were enormously fortunate and uh, we, we found a, a pair of designers named Rob and Charlotte Eargang who, um, uh, we honestly, we would not have done this if we hadn't found them. But part, part of our process with developing this concept was finding graphic designers um, who were not just layout people but were avid gamers who were artists who were creatives who could bring um a, a whole point of view and a level of creativity to what they're doing and um they're doing absolutely amazing work and I, I, honestly if, if we hadn't found them we'd still be waiting to try to figure this thing out um <laughs> really um one of the things I miss most about cons, um, because we met them at a con, they just happened to come up to the table and said, we love what you guys are doing. Here's what we're doing. Could we work together at some point? And um, that's where the conversation started. And that's, again, that's the only reason this product exists is because they came to our booth and started a conversation with us. Yeah, um, it's all it takes. That's yeah. conventions, yeah. man. I miss them. Sure. I get paid to network. I miss them so much. I miss them so much. <laughs> Um, so we'll there eventually. they made a lot of very difficult things, uh, a lot more bearable. Um, and we've yeah. thrown them some very difficult tasks and, and they've been really, really masterful at, uh, turning those things into, uh, real pages and, and real designs and, and real art. So, uh, um, yeah. is there anything difficult you just had to cut right away? Like not possible? out of that difficult stuff? Like, is there anything out of the four of you went, this shit isn't happening. It's gone. We're not putting 18 bookmarks in here. It's gone. <laughs> well, I'll tell you that, that, that dry erase board kind of came and went from that particular category more than a few times. Yeah. There were a lot of iterations of how that thing was going to work. What was before... the problem? Stitching it to the book, finding a place to store it, or the material? Yeah, Most itself? of it is. Yeah. Getting, getting it to integrate with the book. It's, it's actually, it's a real, uh, it's a real design challenge. And like you said, we've never been in the book publishing business before. Um, so, uh, we, we had to go through a lot of different design concepts of finding a way to make room in the binding so that it wouldn't break the binding. Uh, it wouldn't make, you know, one of the things about this is that we're putting it on lay flat binding so that you can really write on it very easily right. on both sides. But if you put, if you put the board in the back and then you make the stability of the back based on the board. Every time you take the board out, now you've got an unstable back and you can't write on that side. Anymore. Yep. So we've been working really hard to solve that challenge. And, and uh, from a technical point of view, that's definitely been the biggest challenge. Um, hey, Paul, you were going to say something about the dry erase that it had come and gone. There was there something. Oh, just, no, just, I mean, exactly what Bill's saying is that, you know, we initially had this great idea for it and then, we realized that that wasn't going to work. And then we thought maybe we we're going to have to get rid of it. And then, you know, we came up with other ideas and it was in, it was out. And then finally, you know, Bill working with, uh, with the, the book publisher was able to come up with this. Nice. Uh, the other thing, I mean, I think the one thing sort of to Bill's point about the, the, the cons is, you know, what, and this goes to really everything, all of our products, but what made this work was people helping us. Right. Like the, yeah. the, the publisher that we ended up getting the, the book publisher was a recommendation, right? We had gone out and looked for people, but it was finally somebody that we knew in the gaming industry who, who knew the business, uh, and recommended somebody, you know, meeting Robin Shar uh, at, at Gen Con, uh, you know, being at artists helping out by recommending other artists. Um, that's, I mean, it, that's always the great thing about everything that we've done so far has been, everybody in this community has been so 
helpful and and gracious and just willing to sort of chip in and make a recommendation. Uh, and for for you know a group of of five guys who have no appreciable skills in anything, uh, they've <laughs> been you know they people come up and help us. Yeah, uh, yeah. And that's been great. Yeah, Huge dreaming an idea. To JP at Gale Force Nine, who has uh, been a a huge help and mentor to us from the very beginning and, and uh, gave us a lot of great advice for this, this I'll, I'll, I'll say one more thing that's been a huge challenge for this. Um, and, and this is just the reality of, of the world we live in is uh, we were really, uh, really looking forward to taking this idea to Gen Con in August yeah. and, and having that opportunity to spread the word about it and interact with, Pathfinder fans. And, um, so getting the word out without cons has been a real challenge and we're yeah. so hopeful that come next August, we are able to go to Indy and set up a booth in the, the Pathfinder area and finally get a chance to really interact with people one-on-one -on -one and show them what we're doing and, um, you know, hopefully, um, earn some trust that way. Yeah. So, yeah, that was one of the questions I had earlier. One more time, Paul. You broke up and roboted like oh, a motherfucker. Oh. What was that? Oh, <laughs> I was going to say, at, but we, we look forward to being at Gen Con and having a table just stacked high with uh, with Chronicles. Yeah. Oh, you mean like the Paizo books? Just the wall? Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. You can high by and shoot at people. It's like I'm close. I mean, if you're hiding there, you didn't see me, but I probably have a flask. So um, <laughs> I, I will say that, like, me too, working in the convention scenes for so long, doing it 20 plus a year, um, I've really had to pivot in how I sell and do stuff. And for you guys being physical product producers, I mean, that's a sucker punch that you were, you got kirked. Like, nobody was ready for the ham fisted hit. How, I mean, have you guys, has it been all right? Like, have you still been moving forward with that being taken away for over? A, it's going to be over a year by the time we see a convention. Yeah. I mean, uh, Gary we're, we're, or Gen Con was just can't not Gary Con. Uh, Gary Con was canceled again, not Gen Con. But that's yeah. that's it puts us at twelve months. Yeah, yeah. we were, uh, were we're very very fortunate. We were uh, you know uh, uh, when when st stuff started happening in March and April, we completely scaled back our 2020 plans um, with the expectation that we were really going to get hammered. We almost dropped the Strahd box out of our plans. Um, we scaled back on uh, the Rhyme of the Frost Maiden. We decided we, we had planned to do a platinum and a silver. We decided, okay, we're just going to do one version of it. Uh, we're going to drop Strahd entirely. Um, you know, we had already started talking about this and we thought, OK, maybe we push this to 2021. Um, but then, uh, thankfully, um, when we brought Rhyme into pre-sales, uh, it sold better than any box we had done before. And um, so we were just really encouraged by that and felt like, OK, well, listen, if if the people out there have the faith to, um, you know, to go ahead and still buy these things and uh, with the expectation that we're going to get to play it someday. I don't know when it'll be, but we'll get to play someday. Um, okay. So if, if people were going to, we're going to take that, um, that leap of faith with us, then, then, uh, you know, we decided that, that we would take a leap of faith too. So we put all everything back into our calendar and it's, um, we've, we've done very well. We're very, very happy and, and grateful. I think it was time is right too. Um, people are hungry for complete campaign books from D and D right now. Um, yeah. we got Eberron, but it was just a reprint of what we saw. I'm glad to see an adventure come out with it, but I think Icewind Dale and Forgotten Realms is, is the nineties baby that nineties, early two thousands baby that people have wanted to see. And it's set in an area that all the novels are set in. So mm -hmm. that was an amazing piece that you guys got to do. Uh, and, and I, I'm sure it'll be something you look back on and go, did we actually get to do Icewind Dale? Like, did that actually fucking happen? <laughs> um, and, and same with some of these other products. So with yeah. that, I before we get, go too much deeper, we're going to be here all night. I want to do our multi-fire questions. It's four questions. One person, multi-shot, one person can answer. 
out of your group. I don't care who it is. You can raise your hand. However you guys communicate in your home meetings with whiskey. That's how you communicate here. Uh, Matthew's not here to yell at you, so it'll be real easy. And there'll be no yeah. monkeys in the room. All right. Okay. The first one. First and foremost, whose idea was it to form this company? Uh, I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, it. It was all of our idea. It was a long, there was a long series of conversations amongst the five of us about trying to find something creative to do together. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll take a tiny sliver of credit that uh, okay. I, I did. I was the first one to throw out the idea of doing box sets um, sort of in the, uh, in the spirit of like when Bruce Springsteen or Pearl Jam puts out a box set, you know, for for the super fan, uh, you know, collector's editions of things. Um, that was something I was very aware of and that uh, I had examples of in my own house and was aware that that those things weren't really be, being done in the tabletop gaming industry. So I did introduce that basic idea, but it's always Just take credit, Bill. It's okay. Yeah. So it was entirely me, and these guys are along for the ride. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's always someone who starts it. That's why I ask because someone always yeah. goes, you know. Yeah. You know. It was, a, you know, it was, it was all. It was, there was a long process of ideas, and there was a trip. Matt got invited to the D and D live stream of Annihilation, which was back sure. when it was still in Seattle, mm -hmm. and uh, we all went together, um, sort of with this idea of trying to come up with something um, that we could all do. And having that extended period of like three or four days of thinking about nothing other than role playing um, really helped us kind of get our ideas together and get our courage up and get synchronized on uh, the way that we saw this thing to the point where we could really um, pitch it as a product. All right, next question. This one's, I think, gonna be the hardest for you. Uh, it has been told that you guys don't play games anymore and that maybe meetings take up all of your gaming slot time. And with that said, and that's been said many places, what next campaign do you have to play? Boy, well, we can't I'll, I'll, I'll answer that. I'll answer that. I mean, you can't say that. Careful. No, I can't. I can't. All I can say is, uh, well, no, but I can say that we, the next campaign that we're, we're, so one of the things about this, this starting the company was that not only did it take up all of our time, but every new adventure that D&D &D came out with, we couldn't play because we all had to read it and then figure out how to make a box for it. Yeah. Uh, so. Welcome to GM life, Paul. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It sucks to be a GM. Um, uh, so we are, for at least a little bit of time, we are play testing an upcoming D&D uh, &D adventure. Uh, and so we are not reading it. One of us is DMing it. Uh, okay. And we are going to play it for as long as we can, like real players. Are you streaming it? No, no, no. We can't do that. No, 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 no. no, no. no. Yeah, no, we can't do that. Well, you could record it all and put it out yeah, later. Right, right. That's true. That's an we interesting could. thought. But uh, but that said, we are we are also um, yeah. So that's the one that we're absolutely going to start playing, and that's going to be fun. Uh, but yeah, we absolutely have to. We we all the time we talk about how we need to get back to uh to playing uh more because just doing work sucks. Yeah. <laughs> well, it I was especially I, will say, in your I just finished. I just finished playing in, in Charlie's campaign. We just wrapped that up a couple of months ago. Um, it wasn't this group entirely. Uh, mm -hmm. Charlie's uh, old friends from high school were, were playing in it and, and they allowed me to play along. So we nice. played that campaign all the way through. We saved the universe. Uh, I'm happy to report. And um, so that was, that was a huge amount of fun. So we, we, we did get to play that and, and it, was, it was really fun to play a homebrew. All right. Um, you may have been asked this. I looked around. I haven't seen it. Favorite piece of art the B and G has produced. Charlie, your turn. Oh, the silence is real. Don't tell me there's too many. That doesn't count. You can't do. You got like ones hanging behind you right now. You know, I I think that one. What is that? <laughs> that is a, that is 
Eberron airship. <laughs> I think some of, the, some of the maps we did for Eberron were 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 genius, and and that particular one is just. I mean, I just like uh, the, the fun thing about maps or battle maps is you you just you can lay them out, and you just it's just a, a world of possibilities. It's like I'm going to have an adventure here. I don't know what the hell it's going to be, but it's going to be on this map. Uh, it's so, like a it's like a role playing game and a board game, but like have a baby together. Like in that yeah. moment, you get to play both yeah. things at once. And An yeah. illegitimate child that everyone still loves. Like yeah, it's hundred percent right. is true. And and I I do think that box sets that folding out that map that first time is one of those moments where you just go, oh yeah, it's a box set. Like your D Lance book one that came out, the old Dark Sun ones. I agree with you. Those fold out maps. Those are my jam. Bonnie Cook Games has been doing that a lot lately, which makes me super happy. All right, so last last question, and I'm, I don't know who's going to answer this one, so it's going to be great. You guys are putting yeah. out four books, and you had to pick a lot of colors for the books. What was yeah. the worst argument for the color of the books? Whose fault was it? Who <laughs> argued the hardest for the color book? We're not going to go dice. That's just suicide. We're not doing that. The book, <clears throat> biggest fight. You know, I... Correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that was one of those decisions that I made as the project lead and just kind of brought it to everybody and said, <laughs> this is what I'm doing unless you really want to fight about it. Was and, that caused um, by the dice argument? The <laughs> dice argument was brutal. That's the question you should have asked. The but I'm saying because of that, is that why you went, this is what we're doing? Well, yeah. we've, 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 over the years, we've, we've, we're at, we're, our antenna has gotten pretty good. And so if Bill brings something like that to us and says, would you really like to argue about this? <laughs> we, we, we see the minefield ahead of us and we're like, no, yeah. no, we yeah. really, yeah. really don't. Yeah, no, I mean, to, to again, like I think, Charlie, your phrase of strong opinions loosely held. I mean, we, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you every, all of my ideas about colors for classes and I have them. And they, who knows what they are. But at the same time, if Bill says, yeah, we don't really have time for that. I'm like, ah, okay. All right. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's, that's a job. That's a job. <laughs> and this is for all of you. Um, you're all drinking tonight, I think. Or at least oh, yeah. like most of you are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I've seen pictures on Instagram about whiskey um, for your nights that you're doing meetings. It sounds like the whole group does. Uh, I think I gave shots to one of you. It might have been Matt. I think Matt had shots at one of them when we were walking around at, at Gary Con. Our game hole con, game hole con, one of those two. Do you have a drink that is your go to for gaming? It's for everybody. Yeah, we don't normally drink when gaming. It's true. It's yeah. usually we drink, we drink I, afterwards. You hear that, Todd? You hear that, Kelly? No drinking at the table. <laughs> Only the GM gets to drink at the table. It's the top. Yeah, uh, I, 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 Coke. Yeah, Coke. Yeah. We all drink. Well, what's Coke. your favorite after game then? Oh. After game, it's whiskey for whiskey. me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, whiskeys. You're all whiskey people. Uh, yeah. I mean, I will say, I will say, if it's if it's still if it's still light out, I'll do a gin and tonic. I'm a gin guy. Me too. But mm -hmm. once it gets dark out, uh, whiskey. All right, I'll bring some Manhattans for us next time we're at a convention together. <laughs> um, Love it. So that's the rapid fire. Um, real, real fun talking with you guys today. I'm gonna close us out with a quick recap just on what we're doing. The link to the Kickstarter has been going through the Twitch stream. If you have not seen it so far, here it is again. There's seven days left on this, $35 to pick up, just the baseline journal, four classes out. They're 300%, actually like 330 now, I think, percent funded for Kickstarter. So it's going to happen. They've never not put something out. Uh, they have new dice as well for all my dice goblins that watch everything we do, that blame me every time I launch new merchandise sorry um <laughs> there's slip colors covers for collector's edition pdfs for those who are paizo fans that have wanted to see a great version and i really do believe this is gonna be pretty amazing and if i'm wrong then i'll then not give the manhattans and they will get below <laughs> so if extra if you motivation to watch, yeah right um that's it for us tonight uh I, I thank you guys for coming on. Thank you for sponsoring the show. Those who don't know about Beetle and Grimm, uh, there are links not only in the bio, there's going to be links on the YouTube channel, but they make amazing D&D &D 5e, and now they've come to the Pathfinder family. 
to give us a little love with some amazing character journals. So unless you have a question for me tonight that you want me to answer, because sometimes I get that guest that has questions for me. No questions, yeah. anyone? No, this has been super fun. This has been great. All right. Well, then I am going to run us into what may be the best Kickstarter video outside of the original Bones miniatures commercials, which were uh, oh, yeah. genius. Um, I'm going to bring us a, a little Matt since he couldn't be here tonight. Excellent. And you can see what this is all about. For the rest of you, stay on. We'll record a quick bumper. And uh, for everyone who watches the show, thank you for subscribing to EFP. Thank you to you guys for coming to Pathfinder and doing this tonight. And hopefully we get to share a drink in real life. I don't know. Sometime soon. <laughs> Someday. <laughs> really looking All forward to it. All right, everybody. Thank you very much. Good night. Hi. My name is Matthew Lillard. You've probably seen me in many a horrible movie back in the 90s. Can we start again? It's me, Matt. Hi. I'm a major motion picture star Matthew Lillard. Uh, hi. All right, all right Sam. I'm Matthew Lillard. <laughs> What's the line? You just do whatever the fuck. I almost had it. I got a booger on my shirt. What's the first line? I was in terrible movies during the 90s. You grew up on them and you watched them, sucker. My name is Matthew Lillard. You may know me as Beetle from Beetle and Grimm's. Last couple of years, our company is focused primarily on the DM, creating battle maps, in-world handouts, jewelry items, and of course, stuffed animals. But now it's time to focus on you, the players. Because when we gather around a table, we're not there to hear a story, we're there to tell a story, all of us. And sometimes that story goes on for years and is remembered only on coffee-stained scraps of paper or three random journals. But worst of all, it's in your head. And why is that bad? Because I'm not that smart. Bill's way smarter than me. When he says it's Grimm that killed the frost giant that was on its way to destroy the town, I can't really argue with him because I don't have it on a journal. And if I had it in a journal, sitting on a bookshelf, you could just say, hey, check out my journal. We all know the problem with a journal. In a real game, when are you gonna use that thing? On a real night of gaming, you bounce from a core rule book to the advanced player's guide, and of course your character sheet. And the entire game goes like boom, to boom, to boom, to boom, to boom, 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 boom. You never go back to this thing. And again, the story is only in your brain, and Bill's telling you that he is the real champion. But what if? Stay with me. What if, Charlie? Charlie, thanks. What if we created a single book specifically tailored for your character class? And what if it had an enormous character sheet to record every detail of your character, every stat, every strength, weakness, magic item, enemy, ally, even your familiar, and then took all the official Pathfinder rules, the spells, feats, and skills that you need for your class and your class only, and combined that with an expansive journal to capture your story. And obviously it's only useful if it's on heavy paper to handle the years of wear and tear, and bound on a lay flat binding so you can use every inch of it. And of course, us being us, we add amazing artwork from across the Pathfinder universe, as well as our own custom pieces, commissioned specifically for this book. And that's why I'm here today, to introduce you to Beetle and Grimm's complete character chronicle. Character sheet, rule book, journal, all in one. The tools to tell your story and the pages to preserve. If my story had been included in one of these, I'm pretty sure that Beetle, the greatest dungeon delver ever, would have been the true hero of the group. Not Bodum, not Tanner, and definitely not Grimm. Because it all would have been written down, the incontestable truth. Or at least, a well-documented lie. Which is just as good. I'm Matthew Lillard, and we are Beetle and Grimm.